love it. I'm going to continue uh, reading through 1 Peter, and then I'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Picking it up in chapter 2, verse 1, Peter says this. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and of all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, that's Christ, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal or holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay in a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone, Jesus, is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may proclaim or declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you have become the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let me pray. Father, we thank you just for the words of Peter. Would you use them tonight to strengthen our hearts, to make us fall more in love with the cornerstone, with our Savior, with Jesus, to make us look more like Jesus, to make us see more of Jesus. Pray for anyone in this room who doesn't have a relationship with you, Lord, or that maybe just feels overwhelmed by the circumstances in their life. Would you win tonight? Would you win? Amen. Uh, Well, hello, friends in the room and friends in Fort Worth and Houston and Spring and the Woodlands and El Paso and everywhere tuning around Tulsa uh, joining us tonight. I'm going to start, continue the series with a little bit of a story. When I was about eight years ago, uh, I got a phone call from Watermark that said, hey, if you come up here uh, and jump on our staff part time, we will pay you something very small and we will provide housing for you. So it'll like enrich uh, that we can't pay you a ton. We'll, We'll provide free housing for you. And so they said it would be in the back house of this family. So I, uh, through a long series, ended up being like, yeah, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna do it. And came on staff here and uh, didn't know the house that I was gonna be set up in. I was gonna live in this back house and they gave me the address and I went to it and had no idea what to expect. I packed up my stuff in College Station, Texas, headed up from, yeah, thank you, there we go. Uh, headed up from Texas A&M, the greatest university on earth and went to, uh, <laughs> man, it does it every time. Um, and I went and I, and I headed towards this house. So I'm going, not sure what to expect. I finally, I pull up to this house and little did I know that the street that I was pulling up to, this house was on, I would find out was a street that's known in Dallas called Billionaire's Row. And so it was like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air unleashed. It was like, man, I pulled up to the house, seven or eight, man, there's Uncle Phil, Carlton's here. This is unbelievable. I'm like, I cannot believe this is where I'm about to live for the next year. This is the nicest living I will ever have for the rest of my life. Can you guys adopt me? Will you be my dad? And uh, it was like unreal, this house. And so uh, literally, if I was to go through some of the billionaires or just the people that lived, uh, the neighbors, the politicians, the sports stars, there were names recognized that were just kind of the neighbors that lived on this street next to us. And, uh, and I say that because I got to know the family and spend time with them, and it was just this amazing experience for a year. And at some point, I, uh, I, was, I began to be friends with one of the sons or the son in this family, and we were talking about the homes that were around and talking about the neighbors that were there. And he goes, dude, that's nothing. There's a house two doors down. It makes the rest of the houses around here look like little child's play, little gingerbread houses or something. I mean, this house, the average house around this street in this area is 10,000 square feet, which is big. This house is 70,000 square feet. And he's like, hey, I gotta take you over so you can see kind of the plot of land because you could go behind the back, and uh, which will make sense why. You could go behind the backyards, two houses down. He's like, you gotta come see it. But here's, here's what else. So it was 70,000 square feet. I mean, this house is like unreal. This is on cribs or something if they still have the crib show. Uh, 16 car garage with its own indoor car wash. A 21 person movie theater. The master suite, man, this is so crazy. Master suite was 3,000 square feet. 
that is twice as big as my house. And that's just the bedroom that these people are living in. They had this, they had a two story, uh, they had a two story suite and wing for the kids that had its own jacuzzis. It had uh, all this huge setup. They had these inside of their bathrooms, two of these huge Carrera marble from Italy, Verona flown in to be there. The, the staircase, $300,000 for the stairs, people. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. Anyways, so he's going through and he's telling me all about it. it and the, there was a wine room that had 20,000 bottles of wine that could fit inside of it. There was, a, uh, there was a gift wrapping room. Who was a gift wrapping room? I guess if you got a house that big. It's the second biggest home in America. There was another home on the property that's 10 acres, 2,600 square feet that the guards lived in. Man, and they were living well inside of it. It had its own full 6,000 square foot indoor pool an indoor volleyball pool for people to play volleyball inside of the pool and a huge lap pool in there. Like it was just this crazy home. And he's telling me all about everything that's a part of this home. And he, uh, he takes me over there and I see the acreage and there's nothing. Like it's like, it's, it was a bunch of rubble. And, uh, and he explains three weeks before this house, it took eight years to build. Three weeks before they were supposed to move in there, they were finishing touches, they were staining the final parts of the floor. Uh, and you can, you can look it up. Three weeks before, uh, the stain combusted and basically the windows acted like a magnifying glass and poof, it all went up in flames. All of it, $44 million worth of it. It was the single largest loss of a home in Dallas history. It was at the time the most expensive home that Dallas has ever, that's ever been built. And this home that was like incredible, I mean, all the different finishing touches by this family, they had put, and here's how it's gonna be designed and everything so that we can live there. This house would never fulfill its purpose. What's its purpose? For people to live in it, not just have it be talked about and have it be worked on, but people to live in it. That's the purpose of a home. And three weeks right before everything would be, or everyone would be moved in there, it all went up in flames. It never fulfilled its purpose. And I start there because tonight as we explore First Peter, what Peter's gonna tell us is that there is a purpose that now that we have become Christians or if you become a Christ follower, there is certain and specific purposes that God has given his church or the body of Christ to experience to fulfill that there's a purpose and design for you and I's life. And as young adults, there are thousands that are gathered here and all over the state of Texas and even scattered throughout that are listening with us tonight. We're in this stage of life where many of us just like that home was on the verge of fulfilling its purpose. It was on the verge of like people being in there and people living there and it never made it. We are on the verge of this unique time in life where you have more money, you have more access, you have more free time than you're gonna have in later circumstances by money. I just mean disposable income. I don't get to spend money on just whatever. I spend it on diapers. That's what I spend it on. You have this like disposable income. You have more uh, disposable time. You can choose what to do. You have, you have this uh, freedom that is unique to this season of life. You're on the verge and in so many ways at the edge of experiencing your purpose but yet so few young adults ever do. And honestly, so few Christians, tragically, even more tragic than a $44 million home, never experiencing its purpose. How much more tragic is it for a Christian to never step and cross over the boundary of its purpose, the purpose for which he or she was created. So tonight, Peter's gonna tell us what components of that are. If you and I are ever gonna experience the purpose for which you, as a Christ follower, the salvation or the purpose for which you've been saved, he's gonna tell us what that looks like. And really, even if you're not a Christ follower, you're new to this thing, it's really he's gonna give us the purpose for all of life, regardless of where you're at in the stage. So we're gonna pick it up in verse one of chapter two uh, as we uh, continue this series. Chapter one, if you missed it the last couple weeks, go check it out. It's all in the app. But we just explored the first couple weeks where Peter in chapter one hits on these themes of being born again. Like, hey, you've been born, you've been given this new life. God has done something, he's changed you. Now you're to walk by faith, even in the midst of trials, that God has done something. And uh, we stopped in verse 12, and really Peter continues to talk about this new life, new birth that you've been given on the, on the next few verses in chapter one. And in chapter two, he transitions after talking about what you have in Christ He begins to talk about what you do with what you have in Christ. We'll read it again in verse one. Here's what he says. Therefore, in light of this new birth, in light of this new life that God has given you, rid yourselves 
of all malice or like maliciousness, don't behave towards people in an ill will, like I hate this person, hatred could be interchanged there. Of all deceit, don't deceive others. Hypocrisy or being inauthentic or just faking it. Rid yourself of envy, of slander, of talking bad about people, of slander of every kind, and here's what you do. So you take that off, you put something on. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Like Peter says, hey, if you want to begin to experience your purpose in the Christian life, what do you do with what you have? You've got this new life. Now that you have that new life, there's some certain things you're supposed to rid your life of and now begin to consume yourself or things that you begin to put into your life. You're to begin to consume the spiritual milk, he says, that just like milk makes a baby grow, you need to begin to consume the things that are gonna make your faith grow. Consume the things like God's word. You need to grow up. Make the things that are gonna grow your faith and grow your relationship with Christ. Consume the things. Disregard the things that are gonna hurt your faith. Consume the things and uh, uh, consume your life with the things that are gonna grow your faith. Just like a child, this is how you grow up in maturity. You begin to fill your mind with God's word. You begin to fill your time with God's people in your life. He says, look, at the point you're at in life as newborn babes or as Christians, now that you have this new life, as he would say to all of us, you've got to grow up. God's purpose for you is not just that you sit there and that you're done and that, oh, you go to heaven when you die, that you would begin to experience your purpose, which starts with growing up in Christ. Our first idea from the text, Peter says right from it, is that you and I are to now grow up in Christ. How do we grow up in Christ, Peter? By cons- any, how do you grow? How does a child grow? They consume food, it all of a sudden builds them up. Peter says in the same way, he uses the illustration, that you and I are to consume the things that grow our faith and starve the things that hurt our faith, that we're to consume the things, specifically God's word around God's people. And he even gives the reason why. He's like, look, you've tasted how good it is to know God, how good it is to walk with God. If you became a Christian, I mean, you've tasted and experienced the goodness that comes from like freedom or from freedom from sin and forgiveness, grace in your life. He's like, you've tasted how good God is and it's given you a superior satisfaction. Now continue to consume the things that are gonna grow your faith Continue to study God's word. Continue to grow up, he would say, to you and to me. And the key way that we do that, the key way that you grow as an individual is not by some self-help book, but by you studying God's word, living in community with God's people. He says that you found this superior taste and it has changed or let it change the things in your past. They don't taste as good anymore because you tasted something better in Christ. It's not dissimilar to uh, when I grew up, and I'm gonna get judged for this, but I'm okay because it hopefully will illustrate. I, we ate from first grade in my house to fifth grade in my house. I had the same exact thing every single day for lunch. It was a one of two options, bologna and cheese and mayonnaise sandwiches or option number two, bologna and cheese and ketchup sandwiches. That was the entire thing. If you came over to my house, like this was just normal. I didn't realize this was weird that bologna was not good for a long, long time. You came over to my house, it, it, there was one option. We're not doing PBJ. You get bologna and cheese and ketchup or do you want mayonnaise? This is what you gotta call. And we like loved it. I mean, every single day we're taking a little red lining off the outside. Mom goes out of town. It's like, dude, we're gonna stack this thing with like 12 pieces of bologna in here, this disgusting meat made of like the ends of the cow they just throw in a blender. And we're like, this is incredible. It's delicious. This is great. Love it. And, uh, and then something happened. Like this thing that like I loved and I consumed so much of, at some point I was introduced to something called uh, the other deli meats or actual deli meats and, uh, and things like turkey. And at some point, like in middle school, roast beef and chicken, this is crazy. What have I been eating in bologna all of these years? And this superior taste made it so easy to disregard it. Made I found something better inside of that. And Peter begins to say that, look, this is the Christian life. That you and I begin to, I mean, to this day, like it literally changed. When I smell bologna, the thing that I consume so much of, I, I like can smell it right now and I'm, it like makes me want to throw up a little bit. That's how like, oh my gosh, I, I cannot believe that I, it was normal to me. And he says, this is what happens in the Christian life. You find this superior taste, which comes from walking in deep relationship with God and things begin to change. It may not happen overnight in an instant taste, but it begins to change. And the more you consume, the more you want of Christ. I mean, I've seen it so many times. I have a friend, one of my favorite volunteers that we've ever had here. I remember when he came to Christ a few years ago, and uh, he was in this discipleship group that I was leading. 
we were talking about following Jesus and what that looked like, and, and he wanted to do it, and he said, look, dude, I'm all in, except for two things, weed and sex with my girlfriend. And I was like, okay, got it. You're all in except for weed and women, so you're not all in, okay? Uh, and, uh, and he said, yeah, look, I'm, I'm all in except for these two things. And he kept filling his life with God's word and he kept coming and kept getting disciples. And the thing that, you know what I didn't say to him in that moment? I wasn't like, dude, hey, if you're gonna, before you begin to follow Jesus, you need to stop doing those things. I said, you need to begin to follow Jesus. And he kept coming and he kept studying God's word and he kept surrounding himself by community. And honestly, when you're around him today, like it would be hard for you to imagine him like not being like a seminary professor or something. He's a guy whose Bible's all marked up. He knows where the scripture passage is all. He's discipling people. He's now married. He's not smoking weed. Like everything has changed in his life. And the guy who was like, man, I just can't, I'm not, and I probably never ever give up weed and women. Like it's not even not even something he's considering anymore. Not that there's not temptation to lust and things like that. It's just like this whole new person. How did it change? He began to consume and fill his mind and fill his life with the things of God, things that grew him in his faith. And all of a sudden, these things just fell off. This is the Christian life. Some of you inside of the room, if you're not growing, Paul and Peter would say, hey, every Christian, if you want to experience your purpose, you should be growing. And if you are not growing up, if your relationship or your faith is not growing, you are not experiencing this part of your purpose. God doesn't have you just sit there statically. He wants you to continue to grow, to be more like Christ in a year from now than you are now. For me to be more like Christ tomorrow than I was today, that he wants all of us to begin to grow. And I think a lot of you, the reason why people will come and they'll gather, maybe they go to church and they're like, man, but I just am not growing. You're not feeding yourself the things that Peter would say will lead to your growth. You can hear a sermon all day, but at some point you gotta feed yourself. You gotta study God's word yourself. You gotta walk in community with other believers yourself. And if you don't, you will never grow. And you're gonna finish 2017 and be probably just about the same, maybe even worse than it started. And Peter says, look, you're gonna miss out on your purpose. Don't waste another day. Don't waste another year. How are you doing personally by filling yourself, consuming things that are gonna grow your faith? He says, if you do so, you will experience your purpose. And then he goes into our second idea about one of the aspects of how we experience that personal growth. Here's what he says, starting in verse four. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, You also, like living stones, are being built into this spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For as it says in Scripture, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, that's Christ. And anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which they were also destined for. So much that he says. But here's one of the key things that he says, is that God is like building something. When you become a Christian, you are, he uses the word analogy, you're like this living stone. It's like God takes Jesus, he's this cornerstone, and everything else is built around it. He begins to place, if you became a Christian, you're all of a sudden entered into this big spiritual house that God is building, where you're connected to other stones, other living stones like you, and you're ultimately all connected to Christ. That you and I are connected to one another, and all of us connected to one another through Christ, ultimately. What Peter points out is what the Bible teaches over and over again is that there is no, hey, I'm just a solo living stone. I can do this thing all by myself. I can live the Christian life all by myself. I don't really need to be connected to other people. We would go, look, intrinsic. It's at the heart of Christianity that you would be connected to other people. In other words, just like in that scenario, he says you're a living stone. You're supposed to be a part of this house. You're not to be some stone that's over there, rogue, all by yourself. The Christian faith is meant to be lived in community, in connection with one another. The second idea from this text is that we're built up together on Christ. If you wanna experience your purpose in life, you will not experience it if you are not connected deeply to other believers. Like if you're not a part of a church, you're not a community group, you are not gonna experience your purpose in life, and neither will I. 
God designed the church to work that way. He really designed humanity to work that way. But even more so for the church, he says, look, a part of this deal is that you would be connected to other believers. God is building this like spiritual house together. This is why the idea that like, man, you hear this all the time too. Hey, look, dude, I love Jesus. I'm just not big on church. Like, I love God, and, you know, I'm for that, and I love Jesus, but I'm just not big on church. You know, I'm not, it's, church is kind of boring. I don't really like it, but, you know, I'm cool with Jesus. He's my homeboy. I love Jesus. Here's why that's a bad idea. First off, the Bible calls the church the bride or the fiance of Christ. Like, think about that. Essentially, what you're saying is like, dude, hey, Jesus, I'm cool with you. I'm just not cool with your fiance. What guy in the world is ever going to be cool with his buddies being like, dude, man, you my boy, man. But your girl, man, she is, uh, she is something else. <laughs> a little lame. And uh, what guy's going to be like, yeah, man, yeah, she is lame. Come on. <laughs> Think about that. That's essentially what you say when you say to Jesus, look, I'm cool with you. I'm just not cool with your fiance, your bride, the church. The Christian life has always been meant for you to be connected, to be a part of it. And Christ said, look, I love my church. I love my bride. You don't like it because there's broken sinners in there? Man, come join the crowd just like you. But I love my bride. The Christian life has always been meant for you to be connected to the body of Christ. And if you're not connected because you don't like the church, you are not connected because you say to Jesus, I just don't like your fiance, I'm fine with you. And you insult God's way to live. And my guess is you insult your savior who says, I love my bride. I'll die for my bride. At the heart of Christianity is really this idea that you and I are to be connected like living stones, resting on top of one another on the, on the cornerstone. We're gonna talk about the cornerstone in a second. But this idea of connected to one another, I mean, it's so over and over and over again that you read Hebrews 10, 24, Hebrews 3, 13, uh, all throughout the Psalms where it talks about how blessed is it when brothers dwell in you, that we're meant to live this life connected to one another. Christianity, as we've said before, is a team sport. You cannot play by yourself. Like, it's like any team sport. I mean, think about it. I don't know if anybody played basketball in here or baseball. We'll just go with basketball. Like, you cannot play basketball with a single person. You think about that? Why? Because basketball is a team sport. You're like, no, man, I can shoot free throws all day long. That's not called playing basketball. That's called practice. You cannot play the sport of basketball without teammates. It was designed as a team sport. Christianity is the same way. And you cannot participate, you cannot play the game without being deeply connected to one another. What am I saying? If you are not a member of a church, you will not experience your purpose this year. You're not experiencing your purpose right now. And I'm not talking to the guy who's like, look, I have been praying and fasting for the last week and I'm trying to find which you know, church, God, local church, he wants me to be a part of. That person, man, God bless you, keep going if we can answer questions. I'm talking to the person who's like, yeah, I moved to Dallas a little bit ago and I'm trying to figure it out, been going around, checking a few places out. Like this place on Tuesday, like this place on Sunday. This is my every other Sunday place. That's the person. But God says, man, go all in, connect. There is no perfect church. There's just imperfect people devoted to a perfect savior. Join the crowd. Use yourself and your gifts and who's God made you to make his church even stronger. Christianity is a team sport. If you're not connected, you're not playing it. He uses the idea of the foundation, a cornerstone. So in the ancient world, they, they wouldn't build the foundation or they wouldn't build in the same way we do today. A cornerstone essentially was like, it was the rock, the, the most important rock that everything else was built on top of. It was the most valuable. They would take the most time selecting and choosing which stone that everything would be built on and the cornerstone because every other stone rested indirectly on the cornerstone. You take the cornerstone out, everything will crumble. And Peter says, this is how the, the church of Christ is. This is how Christianity is to be lived. It's like Christ is the center. He's the thing that all of life is to be built around and all of us, and we're connected to other people who build their life around him. A cornerstone is the thing that everything's built around. In the same way, he says, Jesus is the cornerstone of your life. And he's to be the cornerstone of the church. The you and I are to build our life around him. You got relationships, I got relationships, where we have friends, there's groups of people, they build their lives around lots of things. People build their lives around, hey, where's the next party at? People build their lives around the weekend, like, hey, everything kind of revolves around the weekend, and I can't make that change because I'm going out here. People build their lives, they 
change their, uh, everything about their lives around making more money. I'm gonna move to this city. I'm gonna do that job. People build their lives on a lot of things. He says, for Christians, they are to build their lives around Christ and surround themselves with other people who build their lives around Christ. As we say often, man, you gotta change your playmates and your playground that you build your life around Christ, which involves, by the way, being surrounded by other people who are building their life around Christ. Change your playmates and playgrounds or change your team and your teammates to use the sports analogy from earlier. Peter says, if you wanna experience your purpose, it won't happen by you just coming on a Tuesday and being sincere and I love the music and this is great, but it will not happen if you just leave here and you go back to the same friends, go back to the same toxic relationships. The same friends who are not trying to lift you up but are pulling you down, even though they don't even realize it. Nobody's like intentionally like, dude, I gotta pull you down. They just by their presence and what they're inviting you to participate in are going to. And Peter says, you won't experience your purpose, you won't grow, and you will miss out on what God has created and given you salvation for. You're missing out on life if you're not connected and being built up with a together on Christ. He finishes and gives us the last thing, and it's a part of just this new life and the purpose that we have for it, a part of our purpose as those who have the new life in Christ. He says this in verse nine. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. He chose you. You're this holy royal priesthood. He identifies all these different uh, Uh, figurative expressions of the Old Testament. In other words, the Old Testament had three authority figures, the priest, the king, and the prophet. And Peter says, man, there's no more elites in God's kingdom. You're a royal priesthood. It's like you make up part of the king. It's like you make up part of the priesthood. He's about to say you declare, which is what a prophet do. In Christ, there's no elites. It's level ground. Christ has made something new, and he chose you. Not chose you because of you. He chose you in spite of you and in spite of me, and you are God's special or treasured possession, he says, when he looks at you. And he says that he chose you for a reason, which is this, end of verse nine. Chose that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful life, light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received the mercy of God. That he gives us our third idea, which is God chose you for a reason. There's a purpose behind it, specifically that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, our third idea from the text is like, what's the third component of experiencing your purpose? The first one is growing up. You've got to grow up by knowing God's word and having others around you, God's people around you. The second one is that you're built up together. You're meant to be connected to the body of Christ. And the third one comes from sharing the message of Christ. You grow up in Christ. You're built together on Christ. And now we, as those who've been chosen, we go share the message of Christ. All three are deeply a part of your purpose. You will not experience it apart from this. He says that I saved you to go send you out into the world. I saved you not just so that you would sit in your chair and that you'd sing some songs, but that so you would now be able to go out into the places you work and the places that you live and the family tables that you sit at to every single place that you would begin to go declare not the praises of Watermark or the porch or of yourself or of whatever uh, you know, skills and abilities you have, that you would declare the praises of Christ or of Jesus, of God, the one who called you out of darkness, who changed your life if you're a Christian. At the heart of your purpose is this idea of sharing the Christian message. Uh, Or you may have heard it called evangelism, that you would go and you'd go tell people about what God has done for you. You will not experience your purpose. If you said, nope, I'm definitely not gonna go do that. I think some of the barriers, honestly, to where why we don't go share the message are maybe the most helpful things to talk to. Because here's some of the things that I feel like I hear all the time about like, dude, I'm just not very good at that and it gets so uncomfortable. I get, my palms are sweating right now thinking about it. And, uh, and all that's understandable. And, and some of them come, I wrote down some of the barriers that uh, I'll hear of like, hey man, I just, I'm, I'm not perfect. So I feel like if I go share, uh, you know, I gotta have it all together. You're not perfect. That's the point. You can't be a Christian if you say, hey, just, uh, you wanna worship my God? I'm perfect. No one who's, who is a Christian has that message. You're not a Christian if you think that. A person, a Christian is someone who says, I'm not perfect. I have a perfect savior. I'm imperfect. 
I imperfectly love him now. I've imperfectly lived in my past and I'll imperfectly live in my future. But I have a perfect savior who is driving out the fear in my life with his perfect love and I'm finding freedom in him. That's the message of Christianity. You being like, hey, but I'm not perfect and I just feel like I don't have it. That's the point. Just say to your coworkers, look, I'm a hypocrite. But do you know that Jesus died for you on the cross just like he died for my hypocrisy, for my sin in my life? And whoever just trusts in him will have eternal life? That's what you do. The fact that you're not perfect isn't a barrier. It's a platform, if anything. He goes, uh, another one is that, like, man, I, well, I'm just introverted, or I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't know that it matters. I mean, no one would say, like, ah, yeah, don't, yeah, don't experience your purpose. That's fine. You live your whole life and be purposeless. You're an introvert. No one would say that's okay, <laughs> Right? Like how tragic is it if somebody's like, no, I just can't. I cannot, I'm stepping up to the line of the purpose for my existence and I think I'm good. I'm gonna go sit in a corner by myself and uh, experience introvertedness. Like that's so crazy. But I, I like resonate or have a heart for that because I think some of the reasons why introverts or all of us could struggle with sharing is because we just don't know exactly how. How do you get into the conversation? How do I do it in a way that's not just weird and awkward? And they're like, oh man, that guy just, Jesus juked me. And he's like, is that coffee hot? You know what's really hot? Hell. Have you heard of how you don't have to go there? Like, how do you do it in a, in a way that's not awkward and not that way? <laughs> but that may be gold, man. Somebody try that and it may work. We'll be like, <laughs> gotta keep going. Uh, it's, how do you get in the conversation? Here's some things like super tactically. This was so helpful to me. I remember like moving to Watermark eight years ago and it was, it was a place that I've never seen just examples of what this looks like so well. JP being one of them. He's one of the best in the world that I know of it. Todd has just created, our senior pastor has created a, a culture around here that's so good of it. I remember uh, hearing just tactical sentences that, that helped me so easily or helped me so much more get in the conversation. Things like this that are used all the time, which is anytime they were out and about asking the question, hey, do you have a faith? Like, do you have a faith? And they'll go, what, of what? And do you have a faith, like a belief, a religion? And they'll either go, yes, I do, it's X, or no, I don't, or I did growing up, and you're in. Oh, cool. Hey, can I tell you what I believe? Things like this. I mean, I, this happened a few weeks ago at a friend that I was talking with that worked at Barnes & Noble, and we were talking about faith and talking about Christianity, and he was like, nah, man, I don't really do that. And I just said, man, hey, you're clearly an educated guy. Do you know what the central message of the Bible is? Like, if you were to, like, distill it into a sentence, I mean, I, I know you're clearly intelligent, so I'm sure you'd want to know if you don't know, but, but do you know what it is? And he was like, man, I don't know if I could, I could exactly put it, you know, God and a religious system. Hey, let me tell you, the central message of the Bible is this. That God created the world. Man disobeyed God and he introduced sin. And God, rather than allow man to keep running from him and keep rebelling him or just to kill him and, and wipe him out, decided that he would become a man and that he would die for the creation, mankind that he made in his image. The creation he's crazy about. Essentially, in a few words, it's God loved, so God gave that's the message of Christianity. Messages are questions like, hey, you know, I mean, I feel like there's just little tactical things are super helpful. Easter is about to come up. Here's what you can do at your table. You're eating dinner. You're eating breakfast. You're coming. There's a waiter that comes up. Hey, we were just talking about Easter. And, uh, you know, what do you think? So Jesus dies. Do you think he rises from the dead or not? It's a common, it's like a current event that's taking place in culture. Immediately ask him or ask him. They're not going to be like, what the? F here's your food. Unbelievable. <laughs> This is crazy. You're gonna go, uh, oh man, that's a tough, I don't know, man, I, I don't know. And you just go, hey, can I tell you that I believe that he rose from the dead? Here's why that's important. Because the Bible doesn't teach good people go to heaven and forgiven, or I mean, and bad people go to hell. It doesn't teach good people in heaven, bad people in hell. It teaches forgiven people go to heaven. And there's only one way to get forgiveness. Bad people get forgiveness. Good people, by our standards, get forgiveness. But it can only happen one way, which is trusting in Jesus and what he did on the cross, dying for you and rising again. Why do I believe that Jesus came back alive? One, because he changed my life. But two, because it's the, at the heart of what the Bible and the gospel teaches. If he didn't rise from the dead, we worship a guy who just died. Everybody dies. We worship a guy who conquered death and he changed the world and he's changing my world. 
Would you like to come to Easter? That coffee's hot. <laughs> uh, or just this, here's another barrier that people have. So uh, I, I don't know how to get in the conversation. There's a couple different ways to get into the conversation. But, but even, I mean, just think about this. Here's, here's the problem with most people. And if you're like, dude, I just, just doesn't work for me. It kind of works for you. Here's all I want to challenge you to do. If you don't ever share your faith, here's the challenge for you. Just begin to think about if you were going to share your faith in a situation, what could it possibly look like? Your coworker's sitting there talking about how hopeless the situation in his personal life is. Maybe you begin to go, man, if I was gonna share, I'm not going to, but if I was, I would be like, you know what? I've found hope in the midst of stuff. It's been my faith in Christ. Yeah, that's how I think I would do it. Not gonna do it, but that's how I would do it. Just begin to think about it. All I'm asking you to do, I'm daring you, step up to the edge for the purpose of your existence and just take a look over to see what it could look like on the other side. It's at the heart of why you have your faith. Peter says, look, you're given this salvation to proclaim about the God who saved you, who called you out of darkness. Not smart enough, maybe you're going, man, I don't know evolution and tectonic plates or dinosaurs. Here's what no one can deny, no one can debate. Your own story. This is what Christ has done in my life and what he's doing in my life. We teach our volunteers how to share in three minutes their testimony, we call it, which is uh, one minute on before I met Christ, one minute on how I met Christ, and one minute on since I've met Christ, how he's either saved me and the things he saved me from, and also he's continued to work in my life. And regardless, if you're a Christian in the room, nobody can debate that. They can debate evolution all day long. They can't debate that. And Peter says, man, you're just telling people the way that God has worked inside of your life. The final thing that Peter points out is we do this together. The way that we spread the message of Christianity is we just go around together, like we're stronger together. I'm more likely to share my faith when I'm with brothers and sisters in Christ, out and about. I'm more likely to share my faith, even if I'm by myself, you know, doing, running errands or whatever it is, if I have people encouraging me and holding me accountable and raising that banner in front of me in my own community group, which they are, that we're all more likely to do this, we're all less likely to do it alone, and we're all more likely to do it when we come together. Peter says plural, the you in that, but you is a plural, it's y'all, or you all, if you will. And he says, you, y'all are a chosen race to declare the praises of God. All of you together is what the church is intended to be, just go around declaring not how amazing you are, how amazing is our God. He doesn't demand anything from you. He's done something for you, and we take that message every place. We tell people that the Bible doesn't teach whosoever behaves shall not perish but have eternal life. It says whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. And we take that message to the streets of Dallas, the streets of Fort Worth, every place. Because we're perfect? No. Because we found someone who is, and he is working inside of a life. He's growing us. He's building us together as a priesthood. And he has allowed us just the privilege to be a part of sharing and taking his message across the world. I'll finish with just this last verse, which is verse 10, where it says this, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I love this. Peter finishes this passage with a, uh, a direct quote from the book of Hosea. Like, this isn't like a made-up thing. He literally, it, he rips it out. He, cop, or he uh, plagiarizes from Hosea, and he takes it, and he says, this was a prophecy given that's been fulfilled here. What's the prophecy? Or what's going on in the book of Hosea? Hosea is a book of the Bible that contains this story where God comes to this prophet, uh, who in prophets were these people that God would basically speak to the nation through the prophet. He would say, hey, I'm gonna come speak to the nation through you and through your life. I'm gonna showcase myself to them. And God comes to Hosea, and it's at this time when the nation of Israel has run from God. The nation of Israel is what the Old Testament is all about. And it's the story, uh, or inside of the story of Hosea, it's where the nation has basically said, we're, we're done with God. We're going to worship other gods. We're going to do whatever we want. And God comes to Hosea, and he says, I want you to go marry a prostitute. I want you to go marry a woman directly. It says in verse uh, two of chapter one of Hosea, that when the Lord first, vo- first spoke to Hosea, he said, go and take yourself a wife of whoredom, and I want you to have children of whoredom. For the land commits whoredom 
by forsaking the Lord. And it tells us that he goes and he marries this prostitute. I mean, this is the scene where, where Hosea is going, man, am I, am I sure this is God right now? This really sounds like the devil. He's telling me to marry a prostitute named Gomer. I don't even have a cool prostitute name. Gomer? Like cinnamon or magic or something. Gomer. And God says, I want you to for a very specific reason. <laughs> I want you to, magic. I want you to for a very specific reason. Keep away. Because in doing so, she is going to cheat on you over and over and over and over again. You're going to marry this woman and she's going to cheat on you time after time. She's going to go sleep with other men. And I'm going to put it in your heart to love her. And you're going to go after her every single time she's going to run from you. Here's why. Because you will show the world. You'll show the nation of Israel. You will show how I feel when my people turn to other gods. That my heart breaks. And the same love that I'll never stop loving you is I'm going to put in your heart, Hosea. You're going to go after Gomer. Just like I love them. The scripture tells us that eventually she's running away from God and, uh, or she's running away from Hosea and she's sleeping with these different men. And one day she comes back home and she's pregnant. And she gives birth to a little baby girl. And God says, I want you to call him or call her lo Ami." not my people, because my people have said, you're not our God. She keeps sleeping around and eventually comes back and she's pregnant again with some other guy's baby. And he says, call them, call the boy this time. La Ramah, not received mercy. She continues to sleep around and and she continues to go so far as eventually she sells herself into prostitution. She becomes the property of another man. And Hosea eventually hears that, man, where's my wife? Who I love. And he finds out that she's she's been sold. She's like on an auction block to be sold. And the spirit of God comes, Hosea chapter three, and it says that the Lord came to Hosea and he said, go and love a woman who's an adulteress. Just like the love of the Lord for the nation of Israel. Though they turn their backs and they commit idolatry and they run towards other gods, go love her again, Hosea. And he goes and loves her. He sees her on the auction block. And he sees, this, I mean, she's about to be sold. Somebody's standing there like, hey, what's the highest price I'll take you? He says, man, that's my wife. This is how much she costs. He doesn't even have enough money. So he takes these 15 shekels, we're told. He takes all the money that he has and he has to go home and like get some of his stuff and be like, will you take this? I've got this money and will you take this stuff? Whatever the price, I'll pay it. And he sets her free. And inside of the book of Hosea, this prophecy is given. These exact words where Peter picks up and years later the Holy Spirit says, this prophecy is now fulfilled. Inside of the story where Hosea, just like God in the story, we're Gomer. God is Hosea, who after time and time again of us running from him says, whatever the price, I'll pay it. My son, I'll pay it. This is how much I love you. This is how much I love the human race. Though they run from me, though they rebel from me, though they turn their back on me, whatever the price, I'll pay it. And he says inside of this book, man, I love this. He speaks of this day and he says, there will come a day where these children that we've named, not my people, and have not received mercy, just like they're illegitimate children, just like they're undeserving, just like their mother. Yet despite all of it, I love them. Despite all of it, Hosea loves them. He says inside of they will come someday, Hosea chapter two, verse 23. Someday the Lord says, I will look on those who I have called not my people, and I will call them my people. I will look on those who I've called not received mercy or not loved, and they will receive mercy. And Peter says, this prophecy has been filled. This is the message that we go tell people. How amazing is the God who's out there? The story of Hosea is all seen most clearly in the story of the cross. We are like Gomer. We've done nothing but run from God. Wherever you are in the room, you're like Gomer. Every single person you work next to is like Gomer. It's like someone who's turned their back, who's made themselves a God, who's chased after things in this world, who's tried to get addicted to either pain pills or in their rebellion has gotten addicted to whatever it is, pornography, sexuality, whatever it is, they've run from him. And what does God do? What does the heart of God do? 
He runs after his people. Whatever the price, I will pay it so that there will come a day where I will say to those, despite their rebellion, despite their undeserving, many of them even think they deserve it. That's how broken they are. I love them. Whatever the price, I'll pay it. And he says, Peter says, that's who we are. And that's where we go tell people. That's why we go spread the message everywhere. Because the God who is there is greater than they, anyone could have ever imagined. Has a grander love than anyone could ever fathom, anyone has ever experienced. And he loves them more than we ever could and we ever will. And he invites us to be a part of that. Do you know this God? And be a part of telling them about the greatness of our God. That Hosea and his relentless pursuit shows just a fraction of. That's the God who's there. That's the God we tell people about. That's the God, if you ever are to know him, you'll come to know. Let me pray. Father, we, there are no words for this kind of love. I can't even begin to understand how someone would sacrifice a life, let alone the eternal life of God for someone as lowly as us who despite just being your creation made in your image, you just love incredibly so much so that you would give your life whatever the price. Would you kindle just that story, that message, that truth inside of my heart, Lord? Would we be more able and more readily just to, um, able to share of how incredibly good our God is. How amazing is his love. There's no love like this in other faiths. There's no love like this in this world. It's found in one place, which is you, Lord. Would you allow us to be your messengers to experience our purpose, which is to know you and to make new you known for anyone inside of this room who, like me, can easily cower and not be bold to share the hope that you alone offer would you win, Lord? Where we're weak in our hearts, would you conquer that? Would your perfect love cast out fear? Father, we love you. We thank you that you have given us the privilege of knowing you and walking with you. We worship you. Amen.